Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadikap. Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today we're going to be discussing the Eightfold Path. This is the path for all humans to Nibbana or enlightenment. If you are on the path with the Buddhist teachings to seek this mental state of enlightenment or Nibbana, which is a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy, it's very important that you study and learn the Eightfold Path in depth, in detail, and then practice it in order to make your way along this path and ultimately attain enlightenment or Nibbana. So today we're going to be discussing this in detail. In learning the Eightfold Path, it's eight individual steps. And all of these steps are essentially learned and practiced simultaneously. It's not a serial path in that you need to master each step before you move to the next. So you're actually working on all of these steps at one time and gradually implementing them into your life so that the closer and closer that you're practicing them, the closer and closer you can move towards enlightenment. The path is very well defined and it's very well taught by Gautama Buddha. And it's straightforward for me to explain it to you and teach it to you. But how that path looks in practice for each individual is is very different. So let's start with right view. Right view is something that we actually discussed last week. Right view is the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths essentially brings to our attention that all unenlightened beings will experience discontentness of mind. Discontentness of mind is painful feelings, pleasant feelings, feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. For example, sadness, frustration, irritation, anger, annoyance, guilt, shame, fears. All of these things are very painful feelings. Then there's pleasant feelings, which are like happiness, excitement, elation. And then feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant, like loneliness or boredom or shyness. These are what I'm calling discontentedness. And the goal for Gautama Buddha's teachings in this path is to eliminate the discontent mind. In the Four Noble Truths, and if you are understanding right view and practicing right view, then you understand not only are all unrelated beings experiencing discontentness, but we actually cause it ourselves. We cause it through craving, through desire, through attachment, through the mental longing and strong eagerness for things to be permanent when everything is impermanent. This is the second noble truth. And the third noble truth is that we can eliminate this discontent mind by eliminating the mind's natural tendency to have craving, desire, attachment, this mental longing or strong eagerness to hold on to things permanently. So we use breathing mindfulness meditation and we use generosity as a practice in daily life in order to train the mind to just let go and just be satisfied with what is. This is the central problem that Gautama Buddha discovered about the mind is the craving, the desire, the attachment. And in the Four Noble Truths, he also says the way leading forward to completely eliminate the discontent mind is the Eightfold Path. So that's what we're studying today. Here in right view, essentially what the Buddha is describing is that we need to take responsibility for our own mind with responsibility realizing that we cause all of our discontent feelings 
then we can actually do something about it. We can actually train the mind. Whereas if we were practicing wrong view, which we've all probably done at some time in our past, is that we have blamed other people for our anger, or we've blamed other people or other situations for our frustration or anger or whatever discontent emotions we have or our loneliness and so forth. So what right view is all about is about recognizing that we cause the discontent mind, we can eliminate it, and the path forward, the Eightfold Path, is the way to do that. This first step is really the foundation of all the other teachings in Gautama Buddha's teachings and practices. Without realizing that we are the cause of our own discontent mind, how could we ever make any progress on this path if the real problem is everybody else? If we need to train 7.5 billion people in the world to do things our way, then there's no reason for us to be on the path because everyone else is the cause of the, our discontent mind. They're causing it. So that means we just need to train everybody else. Now, this is impossible, unrealistic, and it's not truth. So what the Four Noble Truths and Right View bring to our mind is that, yes, we are causing the, the problem with the discontent mind, but the beauty is that we can eliminate it. So it's very important that we practice right view. Next, the second step of the Eightfold Path is right intention. Some people describe this as right thinking or right thought. I use right intention. The reason why some people describe this as right thinking or right thought is because right intention, the second step, starts with the intention or the thought or the thinking of non-harm not harming other beings or non-ill will. This is also vitally important for this path that Gautama Buddha laid out for us. This path that Gautama Buddha laid out for us is one that starts with every being understanding that if we cause harm to others, then that harm is going to be returned back to us through the natural law of gamma, of cause and effect or action and result. So it's vitally important that we have the intention in the mind of harmlessness, harmlessness, non-harm, non-ill will towards other beings, because this is going to form the basis of all the other steps in the path. So, so far we've talked about right view and right intention. Remember, right intention, some people refer to this as right thought or right thinking because we start with the thought or the thinking or the intention of non-harm, harmlessness. These first two steps make up what's considered to be the, the first part of the Eightfold Path, which is wisdom. Without the wisdom that we are in fact causing our own discontent mind and we can eliminate it, through the Eightfold Path, which is essentially right view, and without the wisdom that we need to have the intention of non-harm or harmlessness, it would be very difficult to move through the rest of the path, learning and practicing this as an entire path. So we kind of group these first two steps into a larger grouping of what we call wisdom. This is the wisdom, the first part of the path. Next, we move into the third aspect of the Eightfold Path, which is right speech. But before we do that, I would like to just pause here, just talking about right view and right intention, and see if there's any questions from our virtual classroom or anyone on our social media platforms. I'd like to ask a question, David, just to check my understanding of right intention or right thinking right thought i sometimes i think of this as like the direction of practice and i think of it as like uh it, when you're not sure what to do it points you in the right way like i think often we, we get confused because we're not quite sure what the right thing to think or do or say is and right intention is is really about making a decision saying i do whatever leads to the least amount of harm, not just for others, but for myself as well. 
Um, and this can work in quite obvious ways, like uh, the kind of lifestyle we choose to live, whether we um, choose to you know, get involved in various addictions, but also more subtle ways, like is this the right thing to be thinking? Is this the right path to follow? Do I do away with this right now? Or do I carry on with this? So for me, it's about kind of removing distraction and, and making a decision. Have I, have I got that right with right intention? Yeah, you can really think of it that way because essentially what this path is doing is it's guiding you in how to produce only wholesome gamma. Uh, remember, gamma is action and result or cause and effect. Essentially, what gamma is, is it's the result of all of our decisions. Sometimes people complicate this because it's a word that isn't in the English dictionary. And people think of it as this kind of mystical, magical thing that people have trouble observing. But essentially, what gamma is, is it's, it's the result of our decisions so what we're doing in this path is we're practicing harmlessness because we know that any harm we cause is going to cause us harm. So Max, you're exactly right that here with right intention, it can be a guiding light for the rest of the path. But one of the ways that I think about it is I think about it, and this kind of connects with what you're talking about as well, Max, is what's in the mind like you know when you wake up in the morning and you go outside and you're or you're in a business meeting or you're spending time with your family it should always be about not causing harm because as we cause harm in the world that harm gets returned to us you know if i do harmful things to my child then that's going to certainly come back to me or my my wife or my family or colleagues or neighbors different people, or even if I do harm to certain animals or any, any harm that we cause in the world, it's going to be returned back to us. And as we go through this path, I'm going to be using some various examples in order to describe the various types of harms that we've probably all been participants in. And we can see very clearly this harm returning back to us. Because like I mentioned, this natural law of gamma, a lot of times it gets kind of mystified and uh, I would like to demystify it in showing real world examples that we can see in the here and now to show that how through us not practicing this path, it's caused harm. Therefore, the harm is being returned to us. So yes, right here, Max, it's just really important to always guide everything you're doing in life as not harming. And of course, you know, just walking down the street, you know, you're stepping on ants, you're stepping on things that you didn't realize were there. Um, so that's where we have to really practice this in the middle, right? Like we can't go through life and kind of sweeping the, the, the concrete in front of us everywhere we walk to ensure there's no ants under our feet. It wouldn't be practical. But if we awake with the intention and we go throughout our day with the intention of not causing harm, that will translate into other parts of this path, like our speech and our actions and so forth. Yes, thank you. I think um, I can certainly recall from my own life and practice that when there were moments when maybe I uh, wasn't quite sure what to do, when you are behaving or thinking in an unwholesome way, on some level the mind is kind of thinking that that's the way to lead to contentedness mm -hmm. so it's, delu it's delusion it's lack of wisdom right and I, I think of right intention as really set in the direction of saying no no doing no harm is for the best yeah so it, it just removes out all those other options and just and completely zones you in on, on the course of action that does no harm absolutely looks like karen has a question hi thanks david um so in regards to right view and right intention, so to put it in perspective from an everyday um, situation, what if you feel like you have the right view about a, a particular situation or a relationship with someone and you either make suggestions or you feel like the best or this person is perhaps something that is 
what they would consider painful or something of discontent, but you have the right intentions because for the right view, and they, this person, uh, takes your advice or perhaps not just advice, they, they react to you, let's put it that way, in a negative way, and you still feel hurt. So mm -hmm. what, what I'm trying to say also with eliminating the self, uh, you shouldn't feel uh, hurt by what somebody else is, says to you, but how, how do you avoid that? Do you really feel like you have the right view or the right intention, but it still has some negative effect for someone else, um, and they're upset about it. Sure. There's two aspects to your question here. One is, I want to make sure you understand right view, is right view is all about you. It's all about you causing your own mind to be discontent and you being able to eliminate that through this practice. Right view doesn't have anything to do with other people or how you view their situation or their challenges or what's going on in their life. This is all about you accepting responsibility for your own mind, essentially your own practice, that this practice is all about you and your mind. So that's right view. It's just purely understanding that you are causing your own discontent mind. It doesn't have anything to do with observing somebody else's situation and feeling like you have a certain view that could be helpful for them that's not part of what right view is. Right view is, is just purely that you're causing your own discontent mind through craving, through desire, through attachment, this mental longing, strong eagerness, f craving for permanence, and you can eliminate that through training the mind to eliminate the mind's natural tendency for craving, for holding on to things and training the mind to let go. So that's, that's right view. Wrong view would be to blame other people for our anger, for our frustration, for our discontent mind, you know, anything that's going on in our mind to blame others for that. So that's, that's one part of it. But the second part of your question is if somebody says something and you do get hurt, not necessarily connecting it to, to the Eightfold Path. But let's just say you mentioned something to somebody in they react in a hostile way and you get hurt. It shows that you still have attachment. It shows that your mind is discontent because you're either attached to potentially having this person listen to your advice and taking your advice. You might actually be attached to the person themselves. If it's a relative or a relationship or a coworker, you might be attached to the ego and you know you feel like, wow, you know so much and this other person's not taking your advice and it could be affecting your, the ego. But if your mind is feeling hurt, it's being caused by you in your attachments. That's what right view is all about. Is there something else there you have as a follow-up, Karen? Because I want to make sure you understand right view that it's all about you. You know, part of one way that you can look at also right view is this is all about your practice because one of the things that I've observed is in situations where you do observe somebody and you have some advice to help them, oftentimes it's very challenging to get that person to accept your guidance or help unless it's in a situation like this where people are willingly coming to a class and asking a teacher for help. Where oftentimes when we freely offer help, it's not accepted as kindness or compassion, even though that might be where it's coming from for us. Yeah, thanks, David. I think that you've answered the question. I, I did feel like that. Um, it, the situation, specific situation is quite complicated, and it's where I've had to, because of my practice, and I think it's also best for everyone to quite detach um, from someone. And others in the family are not really happy about that. And 
it's it's a situation where I, I do have I'm doing my best to have non-attachment and yeah. Sometimes when we sometimes in in family situations we feel like by not helping somebody like that's a bad thing, right? We feel like we see somebody headed in the wrong direction, we feel like we have some insight or wisdom that could help them and by not saying something that's wrong of us or that's somehow uncompassionate. But oftentimes if you've tried once or twice to help somebody and they're not receiving or interested in your help, Oftentimes by not saying anything and letting the person experience their unwholesome karma, letting them experience the problem that they encounter or multiple problems that they encounter, oftentimes that can be the very best teacher for them. And I know it's hard when you maybe have attachment to this person and you really want to see all the best for them and you don't want to see harmful things happen to them. It's kind of hard to let somebody walk into a fire, so to speak. But oftentimes that's the best way because they have to feel the heat of the fire in order to know that, oh, that's hot. I don't want to go there. You know, this is probably what Karen was talking about. So sometimes that's the best way to, because you're able to then maintain your contentedness because you've tried once or twice and then it didn't work. So there's no reason for you to keep pursuing and keep pursuing that's just your craving, just your attachment that keeps pursuing and pushing and pushing. And it's going to lead to discontentness on your part and probably on their part too. So that's where sometimes it's just better just to, to pull back and just say, okay, well, I'm not going to be attached to the outcome of this situation and just let them feel that the, yes, the fire's hot and they shouldn't walk next to the fire. And sometimes that's the very best lesson for that person. But it can be challenging. <laughs> it can be challenging if uh, there's attachment there. Any other questions? We have no more questions at this time. Okay, let's move on to right speech. Right speech is very clear in the Buddha's teachings. He describes right speech as speech that involves the five factors of well-spoken speech. I'll explain these and give some examples. The first one, he says that we should speak at the right time, that what we say needs to be spoken at the right time. What we say needs to be the truth. He said we need to be a truth speaker, one to be relied on, not a deceiver of the world. So a truth speaker so that people can rely on us. What we say should be spoken gently, without harshness. We should speak in a beneficial way. This is the fourth factor. It should be beneficial to the people that we're speaking to. And the fifth factor is we should be speaking with a mind of loving kindness. Essentially, what he summed this up to is he said we should speak blamelessly, right? We shouldn't blame others in our speech because nobody likes that feeling and it's going to cause conflict. If you look at all the situations in your life where you've had a conversation and it's gone well, what you're going to notice is that you were practicing all five of these factors of well-spoken speech. The right time, spoken is true, gentle, beneficial, with a mind of loving kindness, and without blame, blameless. And conversely, if you look at situations where you've had problems in the conversation turned negative, you're going to notice that one or two or three of these factors of well-spoken speech weren't being practiced. And you can reflect on this because remember, the way that I start out all the teaching that I share with people is don't believe anything that I say. It's important that you don't believe me, but instead you learn the teachings and you practice them to see that they're truth. So now that you are learning the five factors of well-spoken speech, don't believe me that this is going to produce wholesome gamma for you or good results, wholesome results. Don't believe me that it's going to produce wholesome results. You can reflect on conversations that have went bad for you or conversations that have gone good for you and notice how these five factors were either being practiced or not being practiced. 
And what you're going to notice now, once you reflect on that, is the closer and closer you bring your speech to these five factors, training your mind, realizing that you're not going to get it right, right away in every single conversation. But if you learn right speech and you practice in this way, what you're going to notice is you're going to have better and better and better results in the conversations that you have with people and you're going to build better and better karma or you're going to have better and better results in your conversations. So, for example, if say Bill and I are, are roommates and you guys are all coming over to see Bill and I know you guys are coming over and I say, hey, Bill, we need to clean up the, the apartment. We need to clean up the condo. It's quite a mess. Well, that's not really the right time for me to talk to Bill about that because that's going to cause conflict. He's got a bunch of friends coming over and it's not the right time to talk about it. Then even if it's the right time, let's just say we're just relaxing on a Sunday evening and let's just say it's not true. Let's just say Bill has been cleaning all day on Sunday and I walk in and I'm just like, hey, this place is a mess. Like, let's get it cleaned up. It's not even true. That's going to cause conflict in the relationship. And then let's say if I wasn't speaking gently, if I used harsh words in my conversation with Bill, that's not going to turn out well. And then we need to look at it. You know, is it really beneficial for me to even talk to Bill? You know, maybe Bill was sitting at the TV. He was eating. There was a couple little crumbs on the coffee table. And all I really need to do is kind of like clean those up. It'll take me 10 seconds to do that rather than even spend five minutes trying to make this plan with Bill to clean up our condo, it would be much more beneficial. If, you know, Bill helps me, I help him, we're roommates. Let me just clean that up, no problem. You know, is it even beneficial for me to even talk to Bill about this situation? And then with a mind of loving kindness, loving kindness is active goodwill. You know, having goodwill and good intentions when I come to speak with Bill. Because right intention, the intention to have harmlessness or non-ill will, by having that in our intention, it's going to then produce our speech. So if we come from a place of harmlessness in our intentions or our thinking, then our speech is going to mirror that. So when I go to speak with Bill, I'm going to make sure that I'm practicing all these five factors. And when you first get started on this path, you're going to have to kind of ponder and contemplate and think about whether you're actually practicing these five factors or not in each individual conversation that you're having, maybe before you approach it or while you're actually in the conversation. But as you do this multiple times over multiple conversations and multiple relationships, what you're going to discover is that you're practicing these five factors of well-spoken speech so well and so closely that you've trained your mind that way that you won't even have to think about it before you actually do it. It will just come natural to you. So some other things that the Buddha talked about with right speech is he talked about not having idle chatter. Idle chatter would just be kind of like miscellaneous, frivolous speech without purpose, like unpurposeful talk. This is idle chatter. He also talked about gossip or slander because this type of speech harms other people. It may not be truthful and it may not be beneficial. So even if you're speaking the truth, but it's not beneficial, you know, this could be gossip. You know, even though what you're saying is true, uh, let's just say a, a third person, let's just say there's some person named Jim and let's just say, yeah, he's got his apartment in your view is messy. And, and maybe that's true. But is it really beneficial to go around and tell other people about this? Right. So this is like gossip or slander. Um, he talked about, you know, lies and talked about not lying in our speech. And through speaking in this way, what you're going to notice is people are going to be more interested in having a, a more deep more connected relationship with you because if if I'm going around gossiping and slandering people and even though I feel like I'm doing that with friends and people who are close to me well those people are going to be kind of a little bit fearful on a certain level in their mind to actually have a deep relationship with me because they're concerned of whether I'm actually going to gossip and slander them so what I'm going to find 
if I speak with gossip, with slander, with lies, with idle chatter, unpurposeful speech, where there's really no purpose behind my speaking, and I'm just kind of rambling on and on and on and on and on, um, and I'm not practicing these five factors of well-spoken speech, what I'm going to notice as a person is it's going to be more and more challenging to have deep relationships with people. And in order to be successful in life, we need deep relationships with people. So in practicing our speech in this way with the five factors of well-spoken speech, then we'll notice that we'll have deeper, more productive, more rewarding relationships with people. So right speech is very important in ensuring that our speech is connected to our intentions. Because we may have the intention, this kind of goes to what uh, Karen was saying, we may have the intention of not harming people and having harmlessness and non-ill will, but when we speak, it isn't necessarily connected 100% with our intention. So what the Buddha is giving us in these five factors of well-spoken speech is a way to ensure that our intentions and our speech are connected. So just to review those again, speaking at the right time, what we say is true, that it's spoken gently, that it's beneficial, and that it's spoken with a mind of loving kindness without blame, not blaming other people, right? Blameless. This is what the Buddha described when he talked about right speech. Okay, any questions on right speech? Yes, we have a couple of questions from, from Bill. The first one is, can you elaborate on gentle speech? I think I would like to, to also um, ask, yes, where do you draw the line between gentle speech and maybe uh, you know, pragmatic but, but necessary speech? Gentle speech is the tone or the level of volume that we're using when we speak. The Buddha actually described the way that he taught people. And he said that he always spoke gentle to try to teach students. And when they didn't respond to his gentle speech, he would speak sternly, you know, with firm words. And if they didn't respond to that, then he oftentimes would have to rotate between gentle and firm speech. And then he said if they didn't respond to that, then he killed them. That was the fourth one. He said he would kill his students. And what he meant by killing his students is he said he just wouldn't teach them. And not teaching a particular person to him was essentially the same as killing them because they were disrespectful and they weren't responding to his teachings. They weren't dedicating time and effort to actually learning and practicing his teachings. So when we speak gently, we should speak with a tone and a certain, uh, certain words, word choices that are gentle in nature without harshness. You know, the opposite of gentle would be harshness. But recognize that as your practice evolves, you may need to speak sternly sometimes. So for example, like with my son, I will tend to speak in the same kind of gentle tone that I always speak with. But every once in a while, if he's not listening, I might say, okay, Bailan, you heard what daddy said, right? You need to eat some rice because you've been eating a lot of junk food and that's why you've got diarrhea, right? So that's like more sternly, right? But still, it wasn't harsh. It was still being spoken with a mind of loving kindness, right? It was still beneficial. It was still truthful. It was still, it was still the right time to talk and so forth. So this gentle speech it's the right word choices and the right tone, the right tempo to ensure that we're not coming across with harshness, right? The, the opposite of what I just described with my son would be like, Bailan, why don't you just eat rice? Come on, you know it's better for you, right? Like if I spoke like that, it might be the same words, uh, but the intention and, and, and the, the, the tone, the, the tempo, the, the harshness behind it is going to cause conflict and it's going to cause harm. Um, it's going to cause harm to another person by speaking in this way. So we need to use gentle tone and we need to be very wise about our word choice and what words we're choosing to include. For example, another example, 
might be I look to the Thai language like in the Thai language they don't have like negative words like the the word for bad is not good or the word for ugly is not beautiful um, they don't really have these kind of more negative words so a way to speak gently is wording things in the positive finding nice positive ways in gentle ways to talk to people and that comes to word choice and also the tone and the tempo of how we speak i want to jump over to a question from amina because it's somewhat related she asks uh, i imagine that beneficial speech means is it a benefit to all parties present in the conversation meaning making sure not to isolate anyone present um well that's kind of a challenging one uh, because depending on h- how a conversation's going, it may only be beneficial to to one person. Uh, for example, in this class, you know, you know, one person has a question, and I'm speaking out of benefit for that person. Sure, the other people could be benefiting something, but m- maybe not. So it's kind of hard to please everybody in one conversation. Uh, what beneficial relates to is it relates to not having frivolous speech or idle chatter. You've probably been around people, Amina and others, who just might talk and talk and talk and talk, and they're not really having what we call purposeful speech. There's really no purpose behind their speech. It's just chit-chat, 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 chit-chat without any real purpose. The Buddha described this as frivolous speech or idle chatter. So this is what relates to beneficial speech. And it would, I feel, would be impossible to ensure that you're benefiting everybody. But sure, what Amina is talking about is if you can involve other people in your conversation, that, that can be helpful, but you can't be attached to that because not everyone's necessarily going to be engaged in a particular conversation. But typically when I'm involved in a conversation, you know, I, I'll make eye contact with multiple people in the conversation, making sure that, yeah, I'm not isolating anybody or secluding anyone from the conversation so that other people know that they're, they can participate in the conversation. But you can't always ensure that what you're saying is absolutely beneficial to everyone that happens to be sitting there. So beneficial speech is more related to frivolous speech, idle chatter, you know, making sure we're not doing that, but we're having purposeful, well thought out speech, right? Like the questions you guys ask are always very purposeful. There's always a purpose. You've thought about the question, you put it into certain words, and there's a certain purpose behind it, rather than just kind of rambling on and on and on and on and on and about a lot of different things. You're very targeted in how you ask the question. So that's practicing purposeful speech. And that's what the fourth factor of well-spoken speech is all about, ensuring that it's beneficial or purposeful without idle chatter or frivolous speech. Okay, so our last question on right speech is, is withholding information from a parent that you know will upset them, is that lying? Or is that just being skillful and practicing right intention? Um, It's hard to say, you know, without discussing each individual situation, right? Because, you know, yeah, there are some situations where it's best not to say certain things and and withholding information, and that would create better harmony in the relationship. But there's also situations where you need to deliver information that's going to probably cause someone to be discontent, but it's their attachments that's causing them to be discontent. But when you deliver that information, ensuring you deliver it with the five factors of well-spoken speech. So I don't think you can always make a good judgment on whether you should maybe hold something back. It's not considered lying if you hold something back. That's not considered lying. But you really have to kind of look at each situation in its own unique setting with its own variables. And this is where this path has to be applied to many situations and you have to see how you would apply it in many situations to really dive into it and 
ultimately your decision is your decision and how you approach that. But depending on who asked that question, if they would be willing to talk in more detail about the situation, I could give more guidance. But this one, it's a gray area. It's not black and white. This path, it isn't black and white. It, there, there's a lot of gray. And that's where having guidance from a teacher really helps out. Where is if you aren't comfortable sharing the situation in openly like this with lots of people, then having a private one on one conversation where I won't necessarily say yes or no, this is right or wrong, unless it's very clear cut. I may just give you some things to think about in order for you to make your own decision because you have to look at each situation individually. In one situation, it might make sense to hold something back. In another situation, maybe not. So you can't really answer that one with 100% certainty across the board. But if you're holding information back, you really want to have very good reasons for doing that. So that's something to really uh, look at closely if you're going to do that. Thanks, David. That's all our questions at this time. Okay. So let's move on to right action. And right action is similar to right speech in that right action is born out of right intention. What right action is about is it's about our bodily actions, where right speech is our verbal speech. So here with right action, it comes down to not harming with our bodily actions, because remember the intention of right intention is harmlessness. So we need to make sure that with our bodily actions, we're not causing harm. And the Buddha gave some very specific guidance on this. And we'll dive into these also when we talk about the five precepts. What he talked about here in right action is he talked about not causing harm through killing other beings. Because by killing other beings, whether it's human or animal, we know that that causes harm and therefore harm is going to be returned to us. And you can see this very clearly, right? Because if we kill human being, we're most likely going to go to jail. And even if we escape the law enforcement, there's still going to be typically a certain amount of guilt or fear where someone's always looking over their shoulder and being concerned of whether somebody's going to come and arrest them or attack them. So the gamma or the result of our decisions can be as simple as going to jail because we killed somebody or it could be the guilt and the fear and the shame that we have as having taken part in a killing of a human or even animals. So typically what you'll see people who are practicing this very closely is like when insects land on them, they'll kind of swipe it off or they'll blow it. They won't even kill insects that land on them. They'll just kind of swipe it off. And essentially what this is doing is it's training your mind to practice harmlessness, right? So one aspect of right action is not causing harm through not killing. The second aspect of right action is not causing harm through stealing, because we know that if we steal, this is going to cause harm because we all work. We all have a certain livelihood that we work to sustain our life. And if we steal things, then that's going to cause harm to another being. Therefore, harm is going to come to us. Once again, law enforcement could be involved. And if not, then there's going to be a certain amount of guilt or a certain amount of shame associated with this. And over time, this quality of mind where we feel like we can take things from people without having permission to do so, this is going to breed more and more and more and more problems because, you know, it might start out with stealing a little bit of bubble gum when we're a child and then it evolves more and more and more and more to bigger and bigger things. And as we go, and we accumulate all these bad decisions. Eventually, worse and worse things can happen to us. So we need to make sure that we're not causing harm through stealing. This is a bodily action. Gautama Buddha also talked about sexual misconduct. And when he talked about sexual misconduct, he was very clear and very detailed in what he described sexual misconduct as. We're going to go through this in a lot of detail in two weeks when we talk about the five precepts. But here, I just want to make sure that people understand that when the Buddha talks about sexual misconduct, he talks about sexual misconduct that would cause harm to other beings. And I would like to highlight 
because of where we are in society these days, that he never talked about same-sex relationships being harmful. And he was well aware of people who prefer same-sex relationships. He was well aware of men who don't identify as men and women who don't identify as women. He discussed this in his teachings. But in his teachings, he never once said there was anything wrong with that. He was just pointing out to his students, it was kind of said like, oh, by the way, you're going to notice that there are some males who don't identify with masculine qualities and there are some females who don't identify with feminine qualities. And that's all he said. He had no teachings on that whatsoever. When he was describing sexual misconduct, he doesn't describe same-sex relationships. And if you understand that this entire Eightfold Path is based on not causing harm to others, then you can very clearly see why he didn't include same-sex relationships as part of sexual misconduct, because two loving, consenting adults that happen to be the same gender in a sexual relationship, are they causing harm to anyone? And if you ask yourself that, the answer I get back is, is no. Two men or two women in a loving, consenting relationship who are loyal to each other and having a relationship with each other, they're not causing any harm to others. So that's why it doesn't show up as sexual misconduct in the Buddhist teachings. And this is what he was teaching 2,500 years ago. And here in society, we're just kind of catching up to that in most places in the world. So this kind of tells you how awake his mind really was, how enlightened he really was, that 2,500 years ago, he understood that same-sex relationships aren't causing harm. He mainly was talking about sex with minors. He was talking about going outside of relationships and having sex with people, breaking trust. You know, if you're in a committed relationship, having sex with somebody outside of that relationship. He talked about if you were engaged to be married. He talked about these kind of things, which we'll go through in detail in two weeks, and we'll relate it to relationships and other aspects of life. But in having sex, we can absolutely cause harm with our sexual actions. And we have to be aware of that because of the intimacy involved. We need to be aware of that. Essentially, what he described in his teachings about sexual misconduct is he said, abandon unchastity. In other words, having sex with just one person at a time, one relationship at a time, that's going to ensure that we're not causing harm to others. Having wholesome interactions through sexual contact. Then something that he didn't actually include in right action, but I do as part of the teachings, just to make it utterly clear, is the action of taking substances that would cause heedlessness. The Buddha has this as part of his five precepts, but he didn't necessarily include it as part of right action because it's, it's kind of implied because it's part of the five precepts. If we take substances that cause heedlessness, Heedlessness means unalertness, unattentiveness, unmindfulness. If we put substances like this in the body, it's going to cause harm because now our mind is unaware, unalert, unmindful, and we're more likely to do things like have sexual misconduct, like have lies, have stealing, have killing. And it's not just harsh drugs like cocaine or heroin or PCP, LSD, alcohol, things like this. It's actually other things that you'll notice that will also cause heedlessness. One of the things that I noticed as I practiced more and more is that when I took caffeine, it caused my mind to be somewhat clouded in my judgment and my excitement went up and down and up and down. And I felt this kind of shift in the mind, the more awareness of mind you have, you will see this shift with caffeine. Now, you may not choose to eliminate caffeine at this particular moment, but what you may notice as you get closer and closer to enlightenment is that caffeine affects the alertness of the mind. You may even notice that high intake of sugar does the same thing. So what you need to be aware of is that substances that you put into the body will cause heedlessness 
or unalertness, unmindfulness, unattentiveness. And of course, the Buddha didn't say, don't take LSD or don't take PCP or don't take cocaine, these kind of things, because a lot of these things didn't exist during his lifetime. So he was well aware that there would be new things that were developed and discovered as time went on. So he used language that was timeless. And that's why he used this word heedlessness so that you can apply this from now well into the future, well beyond our time even, where there'll be other substances that people will discover and use. I mean, people even take spray paint nowadays and they huff it and this causes heedlessness. So the Buddha never said, you know, don't take spray paint and huff it because it didn't exist during his lifetime. So he used this word heedlessness so that you can then apply it to lots of different areas in your life. So this is right action, ensuring that we don't cause harm through our actions. And there's one other action that I include in here that the Buddha didn't actually talk about as part of right action, but it's another part of his teaching that I just put in here to make it easy for you guys, which is gambling. He talks about how gambling can cause problems in our life. And we know that because people get addicted to gambling and their financial situation goes down and down and down and down. And it causes harm in their relationships with their families. And they don't have the money to sustain their life as they would if they weren't gambling. So these actions also cause harm. So therefore, because they cause harm, that is going to be experienced by us. Are there any questions on right action? Just a comment for me, David, when uh, I, I came to you before with a, an issue around, around this, and um, I think you, you rightly pointed out that it, it, when it comes to things like not taking substances or not gambling, it's really about not pursuing a, a t- attachment-based actions you know, because these things are, are attachments. I think it's really important to raise the, the issue of substances because it's a, a, a big movement I think there's always been a movement, but especially at the moment around the use of certain drugs, psychedelics, things like this, as as tools. And um, I mean, as as someone who's taken them, it, it kind of worries me a little bit because I know just how um, how much harm they can do as well. You know, so uh, yeah, just could could you extend this to right action, meaning not doing harm, but also not pursuing attachment-based actions. We're going to describe and discuss substances in a lot more detail when we talk about the five precepts. The goal of this practice is to get to this mental state of enlightenment where the mind is peaceful, calm, serene, content with joy. If someone is putting a substance into their body that's causing heedlessness, then it's going to divert and take away from that concentration, that clarity of mind, the peacefulness, the the serenity of mind, the calmness of mind. Essentially, what's going to happen is people are relying on this substance in order to produce a certain calmness of mind. So, for example, when I was in my younger years, I used to smoke marijuana and I used to do that in order to calm down and relax. Well, the mind was really attached to that and it got to the point where, you know, I could only be calm if I was smoking marijuana. So the mind hadn't reached and I wasn't even aware of the path at 16 years old, but the mind hadn't, it wasn't trained to be able to come into the middle and actually walk this middle path. It was relying on this substance and that substance is impermanent. It's only going to last for a certain number of hours before it's gone and either the person has to keep ingesting the marijuana for that calm mind or if you're following this path and you're learning this path, you can actually train the mind to get to that calmness without the substance, which is the real goal because that's that's real enlightenment. Now, some of these substances like marijuana undoubtedly can be used for medical benefits. And this is what we'll talk about when we talk about the five precepts, that there are certain substances that on one side, we can have the intention of 
causing heedlessness and kind of escaping reality for a certain number of hours and using this substance in a way that could be detrimental to the mind. But also marijuana, like in oil form, you know, through CBD and things like this, could actually be used to eliminate seizures and helpful for other medical purposes. So for someone who's pursuing these substances or or using these substances as a way to benefit them medically, I would feel that there are certain ways to go about that. So for me at 16 years old, when I was smoking a joint, obviously I was doing that just to calm the mind and that was for heedlessness. And that was to me, not a good practice. But even if I was doing that for medical benefit, let's just say I had seizures and I knew at 16 years old by by ingesting marijuana, it was going to help me with my seizures. Well, by smoking the marijuana, even though my purpose is to eliminate seizures, by ingesting it through smoke, it's actually causing harm to the lungs. So this is harm. This is this is gamma. So that's why I feel that someone who is maybe pursuing a substance like marijuana for medical benefits would probably look at something like an oil, which is going to not cause the harm of like me smoking a joint in my backyard when I was 16 years old. So there's a lot of things to think about when we start looking at how certain substances can be beneficial. Things like psychedelic mushrooms and LSD and PCP, I'd, I have a hard time seeing how those things would be helpful and beneficial, especially on the path to enlightenment. I have taken LSD in the past when I was also 16 years old and uh, understood what, what that does to the mind. And that can produce a significant amount of craving where the mind just continues to want that and want that and want that. And it only feels content when it does have that. And then that can create problems in the life. Your life just kind of spirals down. These are things that not only the Buddha observed, but other teachers observed as well. Some of the things that I've been talking about so far are pretty straightforward. You know, we've been taught kind of our whole life to have thoughts of not harming other people. We've been taught to speak politely. We've been taught to not cause harm through our actions. But the Buddha really puts a a very detailed, clear, and concise way of explaining this, where when he talks about right intentions, it's about harmlessness, non-ill will. When he talks about right speech, he gives these five factors very clearly, very directly, that can be learned and practiced, and you can observe the results. And same thing with right action. He gives very clearly what would cause harm in our bodily actions, And therefore, we have something that we can immediately practice and see the benefit of that. So let's go into substances in more detail in two weeks when we talk about the five precepts, because that will be an ideal time to really go through the substances in more detail. Got it. Yeah. Thanks, David. Yeah, you're welcome. So up to this point, like I mentioned, these teachings are, are fairly straightforward. And even when we get into right livelihood, which kind of rounds out what we call the moral conduct. What right livelihood is, is is livelihood is how we sustain our life. This is the activities that we do to sustain our life. You know, are we a nurse? Are we a doctor? Are we a trash collector? Are we a a janitor? Are we a taxi driver? Are we a computer programmer? Are we a stay-at-home mom? Are we a a grandmother who donates our time to charitable causes. You know, what are we doing with our daily life to sustain our life? And the Buddha essentially gives us five livelihoods that he says, absolutely, if we do these things, they are going to cause harm in the world and therefore harm is going to be returned to us. And it's very clear. Once again, it's very clear cut. He says, if we sell substances that cause heedlessness, right? So if we sell drugs and alcohol and other substances, this is going to cause harm in the world. So therefore, it's going to cause harm to us. And again, don't believe me on this. You can look at this and know that it's true because if I stood on the street corner and sold cocaine or heroin, bad things are going to happen to me. Either I'm going to be arrested 
I may be murdered. I may be robbed. I may be beat up. I may get addicted to the substance myself. Selling substances that cause heedlessness is going to cause harm to other people and therefore harm is going to come to me. And there's all types of harms that happen to people who do that. He also talked about selling poison. If we sell poison, because poison is meant to kill other beings. So therefore, if we sell poison, it's going to cause harm. So harm is going to come to us. He also talked about selling weapons, right? Like selling guns and knives and weapons that are essentially going to be used to kill other people. So if we do that, then it's going to cause harm to others. So therefore, harm is going to come to us. And then he also talked about selling living beings, like selling animals, selling humans, slaves, human trafficking, you know, prostitution, things like this. So selling living beings or, or trading or having a business where our livelihood is dependent on selling living beings. And we know that this has caused tremendous amount of harm in the world because, you know, right now a lot of people are dealing with coronavirus. And where did this come from? It came from a market in China that was selling living beings where people were going to in order to buy living beings and, and sell meat. That's the fifth one, selling meat. So we know that by selling living beings and selling meat, which is the fifth one, this causes harm in the world and therefore harm is going to be returned to us. So if this market didn't exist, where living beings, animals, and humans were having this close contact, then this coronavirus would be in the animal world. It would be out in the forest, out in the jungle. We wouldn't have this interaction between humans and animals that ultimately caused this coronavirus to enter into the human world. And now we're facing this all throughout the entire world. Uh, we also see that farms that are selling animals and producing animals. It's causing a lot of harm to the environment. We can see that harm today. And the Buddha talked about, he didn't talk about harm to the environment specifically, but he talked about li selling living beings and selling meat is going to cause harm in the world. And we're actually seeing that harm today. If you look at certain illnesses and sicknesses, not just coronavirus, but certain cancers and other illnesses that we encounter in the human body, this comes from ingesting meat. And, you know, certain hormones are being injected into the meat, uh, certain uh, drugs and certain toxins. Even if you are buying your meat from a place where they're harvesting it from a wild scenario, they've actually pulled wild fish out of waterways and tested the flesh and found 191 different toxins in the actual flesh. And this is in the USA, a place where, you know, water is supposed to be pretty, pretty clean. They found things like cocaine and antidepressants and other su harmful substances in the flesh of wild salmon, 191 different substances. And essentially what the Buddha is describing is that these, these occupations are going to be causing harm in the world because if we're selling intoxicants or substances that cause heedlessness, if we're selling poisons, if we're selling weapons that are meant to harm, if we're selling living beings, not just animals, but human trafficking and slaves and things like this, it's going to cause harm in the world. And if we're selling meat. And if you look around you, if you take each of these five occupations and you look around you, you'll see how these are all causing harm in the world. So what Right Livelihood is about is about your practice, is about what you're doing. So if you're not practicing any of these five occupations or these trades, these businesses, then you're practicing Right Livelihood. Sometimes people misunderstand Right Livelihood and they think that, well, you bought a computer which is using child labor in China and because they're having kids work at the age of eight to produce this computer, you're not practicing right livelihood. But this is a complete misunderstanding of the Buddhist teachings on right livelihood and his entire Eightfold Path. 
because what this path comes down to is it comes down to your practice. It comes down to what you're practicing. So right livelihood is about you practicing right livelihood. Your ability to attain Nibbana is not dependent on other people. That's what we understand from right view, that this is all about your practice. So if somebody else chooses to use child labor in their aggressively working children in factories, and that happens to have landed in your computer that you purchased, that's not wrong action or wrong livelihood on your part. That's that person's gamma. That's one of the things that he taught about gamma is that we are the only people that can produce gamma for ourselves. The words that he uses, we are the owners, the heirs of our gamma. Essentially, we are the only ones that can produce gamma. So right livelihood is all about you and your way of sustaining life. And with these three, right speech, right action, right livelihood, this is the moral conduct of how we conduct ourselves in a moral way. And by practicing these three, then we're conducting ourselves in a moral way that is not causing harm to others. If other people are doing harmful things, that's their gamma. Any questions on anything we've talked so far? Just uh, an elaboration on right livelihood. I think it's a really important point you just made in terms of how this applies these days because most jobs don't fall into one of those categories. However, they may, in our consumerist culture, call on us to do other things that may break other aspects of the Eightfold Path, perhaps, even if they're not indirect breach of right livelihood. So, for example, um, you know, writing marketing copy that is designed to water the seeds of craving in people. You know, is, there, is there real value in that? Is that uh, right speech? I would probably argue it's really not right speech. You know? um, but it may be, it may not be a breach of right livelihood. So this is something I got hung up on. I think I asked you about before. You know, it's- yeah, let's say like a doctor who's stealing medications from the hospital. So in terms of right livelihood, they're practicing right livelihood. But through right action, they're stealing. Right livelihood is just purely these five trades. And I think the vast majority of the world isn't practicing any of those five trades. But you can see very clearly if you were to practice any of those five trades, it's going to cause harm in the world and therefore harm is going to come to you. You know, you can look and find stories around all of these five livelihoods of how it causes harm in the world. Therefore, it's going to cause harm to you. I think there's a nice flip side to right livelihood to reflect on, which is that if, like most people, you're not in one of those categories of wrong livelihood, then one can kind of take um, consolation that whatever they're doing is of immense value, irrespective of the job title, the amount of salary they have. There's an opportunity there to, to contribute some real value in practice. So, for example, you know, a, a primary school teacher in this country, they don't get paid a huge amount, but they are certainly practicing right livelihood and they have a and a, a capacity to really influence if they practice well and they take responsibility and they follow these these steps or something approximate to them, they can really deliver huge value in the world. It doesn't matter what their job title is or how much money they make or anything yeah. like that. That's essentially what right livelihood is coming down to is doing things in our daily life that is contributing to humanity and, and beneficial to humanity by doing things that are wholesome and good to help others. And these five trades, these five businesses are causing harm to humanity. And this is why harm will be returned to us. So the Buddha is giving us guidance here of how to choose our occupation. And what one chooses is their own practice. You know, the Buddha never tried to force or guilt or shame people into practicing this, but essentially he shared with them, okay, if you do these five, it's going to cause harm, so therefore harm's going to come to you. But he never tried to guilt or shame or fear people because the goal of this practice is to eliminate guilt, shame, and fear. But he just instead shared that these five things are not going to benefit humanity. 
therefore it's not going to benefit you it's going to cause harm okay so these are the first five steps of the eightfold path now these things are all fairly straightforward i feel you know right view is something that people usually really need to spend some time to understand that you're causing the anger you're causing the frustration but the more you get in touch with that it becomes very clear that that yes all the times that your mind has been discontent you're causing it yourself a hundred percent and then as we go through right intention right speech right action right livelihood these things are fairly straightforward and make a lot of sense well i think the next three that comprise the mental discipline they're straightforward as well but they're probably things that you haven't heard in other teachings these other aspects that we've talked about especially right intention right speed right action right livelihood you've heard in other teachings probably not right view but now when we go into right effort let's talk about what right effort is there's four components or four aspects to right effort let's just talk about one of them that you can directly apply in your life today and tomorrow what right effort is all about is you know when something happens and you start to feel frustration or anger arise you kind of feel sensation in the body and you kind of feel that sensation arising and you actually make a conscious decision you may not realize it right now but you make a conscious decision of whether you allow those emotions and those feelings to come into your speech and your actions or not so something happens that's displeasing to the mind. You feel this rise of frustration, this rise of anger, and you either allow it to come into your speech and your actions, which is going to cause a lot of unwholesome gamma if you do, because you're probably going to be reacting to the situation instead of responding, or you apply right effort. What right effort is about is when those unwholesome qualities arise in the mind, that anger that frustration that whatever it is you abandon it you cut it off you let it go this is right effort right effort is all about in the in the moment as something's happening don't allow that unwholesome mental state to come into your speech and your actions but instead cut it off and abandon it cut it off this is an application of right effort so if you're in a conversation and the conversation is getting heated you can feel the anger and frustration arise you need to apply right effort and abandon those unwholesome qualities and let them go let it go and that's where there can be 10 million right answers it might be that you just remain quiet that you don't say anything it might mean that you get up and walk away um, it, it can mean a lot of different things but applying right effort is literally the effort to, to abandon unwholesome qualities in the mind. And then the other aspect is to arise wholesome qualities, right? So if we tend to be angry or frustrated or irritated, applying right effort here is abandoning those unwholesome qualities. And what you're gonna notice by doing that many, many times over an extended period of time that it will get easier and easier and easier to apply right effort and the more that you do that that you won't even notice the rise of frustration at all this is where i talk about it goes from anger to frustration to irritation to annoyance to maybe a slight dislike to a sa that same situation happens and you feel nothing at all and this is through applying right effort this is also why in breathing mindfulness meditation we train the mind to let go of the thoughts and cut off the thoughts because by doing that in meditation and doing that multiple times multiple sessions over many days and many weeks then when it's in, you're in the heat of the moment where you feel the frustration or you feel the irritation if you've trained the mind well in meditation where you can now control the mind because you've trained it so well when you're in the heat of the moment you can apply right effort and abandon those unwholesome qualities very easily and very readily and it's going to take training for you to do this more and more so the four aspects that the buddha talks about here in right effort is one he talks about 
preventing any unwholesome qualities from arising in the mind. So prevent unwholesome qualities from arising in the mind. So let's just take an easy one. Like none of you guys are probably thinking about going out and killing another human being. This isn't something that's entered into your mind. So the first aspect of right effort is to prevent that from ever arising in the mind at all. Don't even ever allow that to come into the mind. The second aspect of, and there's lots of other things, not just killing, but you know, maybe you've never thought about cheating on your partner, um, having sex with somebody else. You know, there's many different examples of unwholesome qualities, but essentially he's saying, keep unwholesome qualities out of the mind, prevent them from coming into the mind. The second aspect of right effort is any unwholesome qualities that exist in the mind, eliminate them from the mind. So sticking with the sexual misconduct, if I have a feeling of cheating on a partner and that's something that's in the mind and maybe I've even done that before, now to apply right effort, if I see someone or I have a feeling or a craving to cheat on my partner, applying right effort would be to abandon that from the mind. I use with my son, I use language, we say, kick it out, kick it out of the mind, right? So let it go out of the mind. That's the second aspect of right effort. Abandon any unwholesome qualities that have arisen in the mind. The third aspect of right effort is any wholesome qualities that have not yet come into the mind take effort to arise those wholesome qualities. So if you tend to not be very generous or you tend to not have much loving kindness or much compassion and those things aren't in your mind right now, then you should take the effort to arise those qualities in the mind. Take the effort to be generous because you know you're not a generous person. If you don't have loving kindness, take the effort to bring loving kindness, active goodwill. If you're not very compassionate, if you don't have concern for others' misfortune, take the effort to arise that wholesome quality in the mind. Or if you are right now maybe not being loyal to your partner, take the effort to arise that wholesome quality in the mind, right? That's the third aspect of right effort. In the fourth, qual- the fourth aspect of right effort, is any wholesome qualities that currently exist in the mind, take effort to support those, encourage those, and don't allow them to fade. So if you are a generous person, support that, encourage that, continue to practice that, don't allow it to fade. If you are a compassionate or loving person, if you are loyal to your partner, and you're a good friend, and and you have these very good, wholesome qualities, support those. Take the effort to support those. So right effort breaks down into these four various aspects, but one that I think can be very helpful on this path to enlightenment as you feel frustration, as you feel anger, as you feel irritation or annoyance, take the effort to abandon that in the heat of the moment. Oftentimes people ask me when they're angry and they're in a conversation that's heated, is that the right time to meditate? Well, no, that's the right time to apply right effort. Meditation is practice that you do as an independent, dedicated practice on the side that is consistent and regular. But in the heat of the moment, what you can do is you can apply right effort. You can abandon those unwholesome qualities and arise wholesome qualities. What I used to do early in practice is if something was displeasing to me inside, maybe I was frustrated and irritated and I was working as hard as I could to keep my lips sealed and not say something that's going to cause unwholesome gamma. And one of the ways that I learned to do that is just to smile. And even inside, I might be biting my tongue, but outwardly, at least I was practicing just to smile. And then what you notice As you do that more and more and more and more, that rise of frustration will be less and less and less and less 
to the point where you won't even feel any anger, any frustration at all, but it's through right effort that it's going to get you there. Right? That's going back to Karen's question about if you offer advice to somebody and they respond negatively rather than re react back in a negative way, apply right effort and just abandon any unwholesome qualities and allow wholesome qualities to be arisen. So this is right effort. The seventh step is right mindfulness. Mindfulness is a, is a kind of a trendy word that's on the tip of the tongue of a lot of people in society these days. But let's describe exactly what mindfulness is. What mindfulness is, is awareness of mind. Awareness of mind. The goal here is a peaceful, calm, serene, content mind with joy. So in practicing this path, we need to be aware of the mind. We need to constantly be aware of the mind 24-7. And this is why taking substances that cause heedlessness isn't going to produce enlightenment because it's producing unattentiveness, unalertness, unmindfulness. What mindfulness is all about is cultivating the ability to always understand what's in the mind and being very honest with that. If you're feeling hatred or you're feeling anger or frustration, being honest with yourself about that and realizing that's what's in the mind. Because right mindfulness and right effort really go together. How could you ever apply right effort if you didn't have right mindfulness? If I had no ability to understand awareness of mind, if I didn't realize my mind was getting frustrated or getting angry, how could I ever apply right effort to abandon that quality if I didn't even know it was there? So right mindfulness is all about awareness of mind and being aware of what's in the mind constantly, constantly, constantly. And then that's how you can work to apply right effort to either abandon unwholesome qualities or arise wholesome qualities. So right mindfulness is very, very important because that's what we're working towards is this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. And then right concentration this is essentially meditation. Meditation is the practice that we use in order to cultivate and train the mind either with breathing mindfulness meditation or loving kindness meditation in order to abandon greed and craving, which is breathing mindfulness meditation, or to cultivate loving kindness or active goodwill in the mind. So we use meditation as a practice in order to create concentration. And concentration is essentially a byproduct of practicing the entire Eightfold Path. So while it's an individual step that we're using meditation as a tool, as a technique that we get more and more familiar with through multiple sessions to accumulate the benefits of meditation, it's actually also a byproduct or benefit of practicing the entire Eightfold Path. It's not just in meditation that we're going to produce a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. You can't meditate your way to enlightenment. But through training the mind throughout the entire Eightfold Path and practicing the Eightfold Path, which includes eliminating craving and attachment, then what we get is we get concentration, we get focus, we get uh, memory. We get single-mindedness. Uh, the Buddha described the mind as single-mindedness or singleness of mind. Here in right concentration, there's actually four jhanas or four meditative states that we experience as part of our meditation. And these four states are prior to enlightenment. They're temporary. They're not permanent. They're temporary in that we should be moving through these four jhanas on our way to in the four stages of enlightenment. But here, if we're applying the Eightfold Path over a consistent period of time and we're applying it very well, which includes meditation, then what you're going to notice is the mind starts moving through these four jhanas 
and experiencing these four jhanas. And it takes dedicated practice and really understanding this Eightfold Path and practicing it very well to the point where you're always aware every time your mind is frustrated or angry or irritated, practicing right view, you're always causing any feelings that are in the mind. It's always, always, always from you. And if you aren't convinced of that, you need to spend some time to do that. And if you're having trouble in certain situations, seeing how you're causing your own discontent mind, reach out to me and I will help you to see that. And you've got to always be practicing right intention, harmlessness, non-ill will. And you need to practice right speech, the five factors of well-spoken speech. Speak at the right time. What you say is true. Speak gently. Speak beneficially with a mind of loving kindness and without blame. Practicing right action where you're not killing, you're not stealing, no sexual misconduct, no intoxicants or substances that cause heedlessness, no gambling, things like this. You're practicing right livelihood, not practicing any of those five trades that will cause harm. You're applying right effort. Whenever unwholesome qualities come up, you're abandoning those, eliminating those from the mind, and you're actively cultivating wholesome qualities in the mind. You're developing mindfulness, right mindfulness, awareness of mind, and you're becoming more and more aware of the mind and just being honest with the mind and with yourself about what's in the mind. You're practicing meditation, breathing mindfulness meditation, loving kindness meditation on a consistent, regular basis. And the closer and closer you get to this Eightfold Path, the mind is going to start to open up and you're going to start to experience these jhanas. If you think of the Eightfold Path as kind of like the ceiling, like this is kind of the Buddha saying, here's the guidance to helping you get to enlightenment. The closer and closer you get to that ceiling, you're going to notice more and more benefits in the mind. You're going to notice less extreme emotions. So you're not going to notice like the real deep sadness, the real extreme happiness and excitement. The mind's going to come more to the middle. You're going to notice more concentration, more focus, more memory. As you're getting closer and closer to that ceiling, you're going to notice the mind is going to attain these jhanas. And ultimately, as you move through the fetters at that point, you know, at this point, focus on the Eightfold Path. But once you get into those jhanas, then it's time to start focusing on the Ten Fetters, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Once you kind of, you know, get the Eightfold Path really dialed in and you're noticing more and more concentration, you're noticing more and more focus, you're noticing more and more memory, you're noticing your discontentedness is getting more and more diminished and you're experiencing less frequency, maybe where before you might get angry three or four or five times a week. Now it's like once a week or once every three weeks or once a month. And it starts spreading out further and further and further. Your mind's going to be getting more and more concentrated, more and more peaceful. And this is where you focus on the 10 fetters. Meditation, this last step, right concentration, meditation is essentially the Eightfold Path practice to perfection. For those 15, 20, 30 minutes, an hour, however long you're meditating for, you're actually practicing the Eightfold Path to perfection at those moments. And that's why the results or the gamma that you experience from meditation is so beneficial. Because after you meditate, you tend to feel very, very peaceful, kind of feeling really wonderful. And the reason why is because you're practicing the Eightfold Path to perfection. You're practicing right view because the whole reason why you're meditating is you will understand you are causing your own discontent mind. You are the cause of your own discontent mind and you can eliminate it. So you're practicing at that moment that you're meditating, you're practicing right view. You're practicing right intention, harmlessness. You have the intention of not harming other beings. You're meditating. You're practicing right speech because you're not even talking during meditation. You're practicing right action because you're not causing any harm through your bodily action. 
And if you have right livelihood, then you have right livelihood. You're practicing right effort because as unwholesome qualities are coming into the mind, you're abandoning those. You're cutting them off. You're applying effort to abandon unwholesome qualities. And if you're practicing loving kindness meditation, you're cultivating wholesome qualities to come into the mind, which is right effort. While you're in meditation, you're practicing right mindfulness. You're developing awareness of the mind. You're becoming more and more aware of the quality of the mind. What's in the mind? What are the unwholesome qualities? What are the wholesome qualities? You're becoming more and more aware of what's in the mind. And you're getting, as a benefit, you're getting concentration. You're getting peacefulness. You're getting calmness of mind. You're getting serenity of mind. You're getting contentness of mind. And you may even be getting joy at the end of your meditations. So this is why meditation is so beneficial is because it's practicing the Eightfold Path to perfection for that finite period of time. And then the goal is to get up for meditation and now go practice the Eightfold Path in daily life. So there's a lot of people in the world that are practicing meditation all throughout the world, but they're only practicing perhaps the eighth step. And they may or may not even be doing it the way that Gautama Buddha taught in his teachings. So there's lots of people in the world that are meditating. But what's going to produce enlightenment is the entire Eightfold Path, not just in meditation, but then carrying it with you in daily life. And this is why you need to learn it in such excruciating detail. You can easily apply it in daily life so that when you make a mistake, on right speech, it's okay. You know that you made a mistake, but you just work to get better on your next conversation, in your next interaction. You may have made a mistake where you did cheat on your partner, but you apply effort to eliminate that from your practice. Anything that you're doing now or you have done in the past, it's in the past. You can apply this practice of the Eightfold Path in daily life, and that is what will lead you to enlightenment. This is your life practice. The book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Nibbana. This is the life practice, the Eightfold Path. This is the path that leads to Nibbana, the Eightfold Path. So the more you learn this, the more you understand it, the more you apply it to daily life. And as you have situations, start reflecting on where you maybe were applying it not so well, or you were applying it well, just get closer and closer to that ceiling, closer and closer to the guidance that Gautama Buddha gave you. And what you will notice is over time, this path will lead you to enlightenment. And it takes time and dedication to learn it and practice it closer and closer and closer. So what questions do you guys have on either these last three steps of right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, which essentially rounds out the mental discipline? Or what questions do you have about the entire Eightfold Path? We have a question from Amina, which she asks during the uh, bit on right effort. And she asks, is holding on to our ego an unwholesome mental state? And is this another one of those that we need to prevent and eventually abandon? Well, I can say that probably with 100% of almost all uh, human beings, until you've attained enlightenment and dissolving the ego, there is ego. So you're not preventing it at this point. You're in that second aspect of right effort where it's there, it's in the mind, and yes, you need to abandon it. You need to eliminate it from the mind. So the ego is there until someone has attained the highest stage of enlightenment. That's when the ego is entirely dissolved. So that's part of right effort, abandoning the ego, eliminating that unwholesome quality, realizing that it serves no wholesome purpose. Yes. We have a question regarding right speech from... Ponzi, she asks, is humorous speech considered frivolous idle chat? 
No, uh, you can actually be humorous and laughing and joking and, and uh, those kinds of things. The Buddha actually joked as well. He described in his teachings where he said he understood Kama so well that he didn't start it that way, but I'm starting it that way. Um, he basically said in his teachings that he understood Kama to the point where he wouldn't even tell a lie when he was joking. So even when he joked or he was being humorous, he still didn't lie in his in his joke because he was a truth speaker, one to be relied on. So even when we joke, sometimes we kind of tell a lie just to kind of get a laugh. And if we really are interested in practicing this path really, really closely, all speech should be at the right time, truthful, gentle, beneficial, with a mind of loving kindness and blameless. So even when we tell a joke, we need to tell the truth. Um, you can be humorous. You can tell jokes. But I'm sure you guys have been around people that just tell joke after joke after joke after joke after joke after joke. After joke. It, it's almost it's harmful, right? So you have to get to the point where if you're going to be humorous and if you're going to tell a joke, to tell a joke, do it truthfully, have your laugh and move on to the next thing to maintain your purpose. Whereas if we tell jokes repeatedly over and over and over again, then that starts to lean into frivolous speech, which wouldn't be a practice of right speech. So we can tell jokes, we can be humorous, but we need to also know at the right time, truthful, gentle, beneficial. Is it beneficial to tell 6, 10, 20 jokes back to back to back. It's probably not beneficial because we're trying to have a conversation about something else. So telling, you know, 10 or 20 jokes back to back isn't going to be beneficial. So that's where you have to decide where's the right time for you to tell your joke and then move on to more purposeful speech. I think that's a really helpful point about being truthful when we joke. And one thing notice is that of course a lot of people have very different senses of humor and that probably comes from the fact they have different attachments right mm -hmm. and so if you've got a lot of attachments you can joke about those attachments but if you don't have those attachments there's no joke <laughs> yeah. so so um for example say like uh, somebody came to my wife and said oh yeah i saw your husband uh down at the bar and he was like chatting it up with this beautiful uh 25 year old woman she was really beautiful now they might be doing that as a joke but that's untruthful you know i wasn't at the bar i wasn't with this 25 year old girl and even though it's a joke that can be harmful because now there's a question mark in my wife's mind of what's going on with her husband and then when i come home it's like hey what's going on i heard you were at the bar talking with a 25 year old girl and it's like no, I didn't go to any bar. I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't doing that. And even though that person might have said, oh, I'm just joking at the end of that joke, it still puts a question mark in the mind of that person, which can cause harm. And this is why when we joke, we need to still be truthful because we can cause harm if we're telling jokes that are untruthful. So the Buddhist practice was so well refined that even when he joked, he made sure that it was still truthful. There's a, a comedian called uh, Louis C.K. who makes a joke about people complaining on airplanes. And I've heard it said that, that he's the comedian that all the other pro comedians love the most. And I think it's because he jokes about the truth. But not only that, he jokes about things that are wholesome it, it, most of the time, because he's saying to people, you know, why are you complaining? You're on an airplane flying through the air at 700 miles an hour, you know, be grateful. Uh, how quickly have you come to expect something that's actually, you know, 50 years ago wasn't even possible? So I think um, there's lots to be said for that. A lot of humor is actually very attachment based um, and, and yeah, not, not truthful. That appears to be all of our questions, David. Okay. So, um, all right. Does anyone in the group has any more? Well, what I'll share at this point then is I suggest for all of you guys, if you haven't already read this chapter five about the Eightfold Path, is to be sure you read it. 
and read it multiple times and even listen to this talk multiple times, the more you learn about the Eightfold Path, the better. It needs to get to the point where it's literally second nature for you. And it's going to take time to get there. And this is where kind of slowing your life down a bit can be really helpful to really walk the middle way or walk the, the path with the Buddha. Because if you're in a conversation that, that, that is heated and, and in, say you don't practice right speech and say you do start speaking harshly and it's not beneficial and, and even maybe say you lie a little bit. Okay, have that conversation. It ends and now take some time to reflect and see how the Buddhist teachings are so precise and so accurate that you see that in that conversation, because it wasn't the right time, it wasn't truthful, it wasn't gentle, it wasn't beneficial, it wasn't a mind of loving kindness, and there was blame, that it went awry, that it, that it had problems. That's going to further reinforce for you how much truth there is in the Buddhist teachings. So not only will you bring your practice closer and closer to right speech, but you'll start eroding one of those fetters, which is doubt about the teachings. That you can see when conversations go really, really well for you, you're practicing these five factors of well-spoken speech. When conversations don't go well, at least one or two or three of these aren't going to be practiced or some of these other teachings in the Eightfold Path. So if you notice, and as you notice, that you're not practicing the Eightfold Path 100%, because you're probably not, don't feel guilty. Don't beat yourself up. Don't give up and think that, okay, um, you know, I heard this talk from David, and I can't do it, and I've been working on this for a couple of weeks. It's going to take you more than a couple of weeks to really dial this in in a really profound way. So let up off of yourself a little bit. Don't be judgmental. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel shameful. But just reflect how when you do practice the Eightfold Path, things go really, really well for you. And then when things aren't going well, it's because you're not practicing the Eightfold Path. So this will be the insight and the wisdom that you need to get closer and closer to the practice of the Eightfold Path in all parts of your life. And it will help to show you how truthful the Buddhist teachings are and help you erode that any doubt that you might have about the teachings, which is one of the fetters that needs to be eliminated in order to get to the first stage of enlightenment. So you can serve two purposes here. You can improve your practice and you can start to erode any doubt you have about the teachings through reflecting when things are going well and when things aren't going well. And what you're probably going to notice is in certain relationships, you can practice the Eightfold Path to perfection. And in other relationships, maybe not, because you have some attachment in there. And it's going to be harder for you to practice the Eightfold Path in those situations or in those relationships because there's still attachment. And that's why right view is in there as the very first one. So, You're going to notice in certain areas of your life, things can go really, really well. In other areas, maybe not. But the goal is, in order to attain enlightenment, you need to have this Eightfold Path be all-encompassing all throughout your life, all situations, all experiences, and in all relationships throughout your life, is continually work on eliminating attachment, Continually train the mind through breathing mindfulness meditation to knock down the craving and the mind's tendency to hold on. Continue to cultivate harmlessness through right intention. Continue to work and work at right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, and don't ever give up. You know, we don't want to pursue this path as a craving where, gosh, I got to have enlightenment so badly right? Because that's not going to work. You're not going to be able to attain enlightenment that way. You need to even eliminate the craving and attachment for enlightenment. You need to pursue it as a goal and an objective, but don't allow yourself to get complacent. It's really easy at 10, 11 o'clock at night. Oh, I'm not going to meditate. Or you wake up in the morning. Oh, I'm not going to meditate. I'm not going to do this. Just stay dedicated to the practice. Don't beat yourself up if you skip or you fall down, you trip over your feet a little bit, 
Just continually be consistent, dedicated, and committed to learning and practicing these teachings. And the more and more that you do that, the closer you're going to get to enlightenment and the more concentration you're going to get, the more clarity of mind, the more peacefulness, the more calmness, serenity, and contentness with joy. So I want to thank you guys for joining. On Wednesday at 9, we're going to be meeting again here for the meditation training. So if there's any meditation questions you have or you want to just come and meditate on Wednesday, you can do that. And then next Sunday, we're going to be talking about the middle way. This is chapter 6. So over the course of this week, really dive into the Eightfold Path, meditate, and ultimately towards the end of the week, there's the test or the little quiz for you in order to kind of confirm your understanding that you've understood what you need to understand here with the Eightfold Path. So thank you guys for joining, and I'll see you guys online. Be well. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.